Awesome. Um, let's start with prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word this morning. Bless us through it. That we grow in our understanding of you, that we grow in our appreciation for this gift of the book of the Psalms, that we can use it in our lives um, to receive the comfort and joy and, and assurance that it gives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so today, um, Vicar asked if he could finish the second half of his Bible study that he had started a couple weeks ago when I was gone. And we are kind of off because we've, lesson one took a long time. And so we finished one and started two. So we're halfway through that. So um, this will be a split Bible study. We're going to start by finishing Psalm 2. And then we'll finish by finishing Vicar's um, uh, Bible study. And really, he just wanted to teach because his brother was coming and he wanted to uh, put him on the spot. Okay. I wouldn't do really? something like that. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, we're on Psalm 2. Last time we got started on it, but maybe just to kind of uh, refresh us on your handout, um, the, the first part of the handout deals with the concept about the songs that we talked about, uh, looking at the songs as songs from Christ. You know, the Word made flesh. Jesus is giving us a preview of his life as he gives the Psalms to us, uh, the Holy Spirit inspiring the, the writers, David, for this one, um, to, to give us these messages that are about Christ and from Christ. So that's what that, that whole first part of it was about. And then you'll see where it says Psalm 2, a Messiah song, um, and it's a responsive reading. To get Psalm 2 back in our head, um, let's, let's read Psalm 2 responsibly. And I'll get a second for it. Come on up. So let's read Psalm 2 responsibly. Ready? Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers stand together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one who throws the entire glass, the Lord is prophet. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance. The end of the earth you are set. You will break them with the rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you will be the Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. All right. So those first few questions we, we went through last time. Uh, what type of psalm is this? We said a, a Messiah psalm or a messianic psalm speaking of the Christ. We looked at the structure of, of the psalm and uh, had a couple of different options that, that we looked at. Uh, we talked about how the center, often the key theme of, of a psalm is in its center. That's a, a, a feature of Hebrew poetry. Um, and so maybe one, one uh, outline of that psalm, the decree of the Lord, that's the center. And the first three verses, as you kind of walk through that, opposed by man. So the nations are conspiring, the kings of the earth raising up against him. The next three verses, upheld by God. God laughs at their at the way that they, they look at this. Um, he, he says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy one. So God's got an answer for it. And then the next three, uh, explained by the Messiah. You have another voice speaking, saying, I'm going to proclaim what God said. He said, you're my son. So, who are we talking about? We're talking about God's Son. We're talking about the Messiah. Um, 
And then, uh, yeah, you'll break them with the rod of iron and dash them to pieces like pottery. So, so Jesus, the eternal king, being one more powerful than any, any earthly kingdom. And then the last three verses, the warning to the rulers, listen to him, be wise. Um, Kiss the son, respect the son. The, the, the kiss was a, a sign of, of, of fellowship and, and uh, uh, friendship, right? Maybe today it's shake the son's hand type thing. Um, <laughs> we would like use the, the kiss in quite the same way. Uh, so the structure, any questions on, on the structure? I'm just kind of quickly reviewing what we went over last time. Um, number four, we looked at... Uh, Examples in history of people who did this authority, uh, fighting against Christ in his church, the work of the church. Um, and then five, we rushed through. Uh, the, the question number five is many people feel that obedience to the word of God is confining, like being bound to the chains. Demonstrate how the following essentially are attempts by people to break free from the chains imposed by God's word, and maybe to get us back into the flow, we'll hit this question again. So if you were here last week, you can be stars and, and just you know say what we talked about and you'll have, you'll have all the answers. If you weren't here last week, um, you can you can get an A for the day and extra credit, bonus points. If uh, So all good reasons to jump in here. So the moral climate today, how is that an attempt by people to break free from the chains imposed by God's word? <laughs> But it's not popular. It's not popular, okay? To do it God's way. To do it God's way. Okay. okay. You just don't go in sync with what society thinks about. Okay. Society's okay. got their ideas. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Okay. So if I'm doing what's right in my own eyes, they call it freedom. That's freedom. Who cares what God does? I'm free to do what's right in my own eyes. Okay. Other thoughts? Those are two good ones. How about the prevalent worldview about the origins of man and of the world? How does that demonstrate an attempt by people to break free from the chains imposed by God's word? Well, that's all about self, God, me first, man first. I mean, you know, okay. we're in it for that we get out of it. Okay. So if, if there's not a creator, if there's not someone I'm responsible to, it's all about me and, and what I can do because I want to do and yeah, I'm in charge. Okay. Other thoughts on that one? Our new question then, where we'll where we're picking up, is kind of a the second part of that question. What kind of freedom is won by those who've broken the chains and thrown off the shackles? So we're free from God's word. We can do what we want. What kind of freedom is that? It's temporary. It's in this lifetime. You okay. indulge in what you want to do, but okay. it's not lasting. Temporary in this lifetime. Isn't that also kind of like a false freedom? Okay. So now you're being bound by something else. How, how so? Well, if it's it, if if you're only if you're not dealing with God's words and God's rules, there's still rules out there. There's rules of nature and, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Which we don't even want to follow. That's all of it. I'm not going everything. If you look at any school book, that's what you're going to follow in this or you're following that. Okay. Awesome. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Describe that freedom. Think about that freedom. Of doing whatever I want. Or you become your own God. Okay. <laughs> How freeing is that? If I'm responsible, you want to feel free. Okay. <clears throat> Until you realize that, uh, you know, the things that I've done, now I have to, that's on me. Right? You know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Um, um, there's a natural order of things in this world too, and we just start modifying or trying to just ignore them. Um, down the road, you end up realizing you're just wrong. Okay. Isn't, isn't there a song that says something about a tree? And if it 
if it five the best drinks of water right. and it was its fruit and season. Right. And if it if it dies comes out of the brain, it's not so just by the cut, we're not free if we don't do God's will. Okay. So our we're wired for a relationship with God. We're <clears throat> our purpose is to have a relationship with God and to experience his glory. If in my freedom I'm doing things that get me away from that purpose, am I free? Um, or think about, that's a good place to go. Keep keep here, because I had a different place I was going to go, and I don't want to short circuit that, because I like that thought. Should I short circuit it? <laughs> All right, we'll go to the other place, the place I was going. So, <clears throat> if, if I am free. Mom and dad said don't smoke. But I'm free to smoke. Or, you know, the Surgeon General says, you know, don't drink too much. Um, but I'm free. I can do that. What happens? Physical consequences. Okay, so there's physical consequences. There, you know, we we're talking about the natural order of things that, okay, this might not be good for me. Um, you spend the money you have, you don't have all those that are bad for you. So okay. at least don't have maybe you, you don't have the shelter you need or the yeah. food you need or the transportation okay. you need because you're making mm -hmm. different choices differently. So the natural consequences it can adversely affect other people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And someone who your freedom is harming someone else because now they're talking. You can break all you want, and then you get on a vehicle and run into somebody and okay. Someone else okay. in your freedom. Okay. Make sure I'm like a, a bar on chain or on a leash and they feel like they want to break free and take it away from their owner. And so they feel like now they're free to make another murder, but now they're away from the person that's protecting them. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine was pastored in Somerville, South Carolina, and their house. A parsonage was right on a main drag, and uh, either this is true or he told the story and I believe him. <laughs> so their house was, was right on the main drag, and uh, um, the rule was the kids cannot go in the front yard. They just can't because there's these cars flying by, you know, the speed limit's 35, but you know how that goes. Um, and so the kids were not allowed in the front yard. And then the church put up a fence. Now, normally you think of a fence as a restriction. Oh, we can't go outside of that. But that fence allowed them the freedom to play in the front yard um, because now they have that protection, that, that safety. And you think God, God's law like that. The, the place I was trying to go, and you guys went to great places, but the place I was trying to go, um, next time you see someone smoking, ask them if they're able to not have another cigarette. Mm -hmm. um, someone just told me yesterday that it was their 19 year anniversary of, of not smoking. Um, you know, that that's a cool thing. Why did that person care 19 years later? Because that was a big deal to be able to stop. Um, we think we're free, but then we just get a, addicted to something else. I've got the freedom to do this, and now well, I have to do this, right? Because I'm I'm free to do it. So it's it's not it's not a freedom. You know, these the people who are mocking God are actually becoming slaves to the sin itself, and then slaves to the consequences of those sins. And, and I think you guys you guys hit a lot of that. Um, it's only when we become slaves to God's word that we really have freedom, which. Again, last week we were talking about the mind blowingness of Christ being the, the one writing the Psalms and the one that the Psalms are about, and it being a preview and an echo and all of that. Today, think, think about that the, the mind blowingness of um, I have freedom by being bound by God's law. Because again, I was created for a relationship with God. That's how I work. You know, if, if I try to put orange juice and and uh, milk in my weed eater, the weed eater's not going to work. It wasn't made for that. It was made to run on gas and oil, right? Um, but uh, but we were made to do the things that God knows is good for us, and when, and and those are fulfilling and joyful. Everything else 
becomes we become slaves of, of trying to trying to find that thing that that thing can't promise that thing can't fulfill it can promise it but it can't fulfill uh, so but when we find God and are in line with him then we find fulfillment in all of those other things uh, anything else on six how about seven? For Old Testament believers, Zion was the name often used for the city of Jerusalem. In the scriptures, especially in the Psalms, Jerusalem foreshadows another important city. Revelation 21 2 and Ephesians 5 help us identify that city. Revelation 21 I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And Ephesians 5 Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. What do we understand reference to Zion, God's holy mountain, to be? Heaven on earth. Okay. Heaven on earth. The church. The uh, church. With the church time. Right. Where, where God is interacting with us, which is our case. Of heaven on earth, our relationship with God. So, um, so yeah, if we have, if uh, um, he says, "I have installed my king on Zion, in my holy mountain," and then you think of you think of all the New Testament passages about about uh, Jesus being the head of the church and and ruling the church and and protecting and having all power for the church. Um, yeah, and yeah, he he's in charge, so he can. Laugh at those who are attacking us. How about eight verses seven to nine proclaim an, an intermediate prophecy? Compare these words with Second Samuel seven, eleven B to fourteen A. I see some people turning pages. If one of them will read it for us, that would be wonderful. So verses seven to nine. Um, you are my son, today I become your father. I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron, you will dash them to pieces of like fire. Who has Second Samuel 7 that's going to read? The Lord declares to you that the Lord Himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish His kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Okay. You know the context of 2 Samuel? God is speaking to David. David. Yep. His king that wanted to build a house for the name of the Lord. God had given him victory over all his enemies, and he says, I want to build a house for the Lord. And God says, no, nope, you're not going to do that. I'm going to build a house for you. And did you catch the things he said about who would build this house? It would be one from his own flesh, right? Mm -hmm. That God would raise up, that would build this, this house for the Lord. And then he says something about it being eternal. And, and so we're going with it, right? Okay, he's talking about Solomon, because Solomon's the one who's going who's gonna to build the temple, and, and this will be wonderful. And, and then eternal, and you see this idea of intermediate prophecy, where, where Solomon was the initial fulfillment, the one who would build the temple, but the eternal fulfillment, that's Jesus, right? So, so you have, uh, um, yeah, Solomon pointing to Jesus ultimately, and I, I guess I stole the answer to number nine, in what way was Jesus the complete fulfillment of these words? Well, I, I didn't give all that answer. And, in what way was Jesus the complete fulfillment? He was related to David physically. Yep. So the son of David. He's got a son. Yep. And the the temple he built, the church. Last and last and last. Yeah. yeah. Good. The Hebrew word in verse seven that has been translated become 
is somewhat challenging to express in English. It doesn't mean that on a given day, God became the father of Jesus. What do we confess in the Nicene Creed about the origin of the Son of God? We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten, I'm sorry, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. That's, that's what we're looking for. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Um, what does that mean? So Hebrew has feminines and masculines and neuters, you know, like some languages have the have the genders for the nouns and stuff, and and the verbs. So like the verb for to bear a child um, is uh, the it's got different ways that it goes, right? So so the uh, the normal way, if you're talking about a woman bearing a child, it's in a a, a Tense or in a whatever you call it. it's in the it's in the uh, the cult meaning you give birth to a child. If it's the guy um, causing the the woman to be pregnant, there's a, a a set of verb forms called the hippial that have always have the idea of causing something. So like in Hebrew, you'll have one verb that um, so like, I'll, I'll use a, an example, run. That would be its base, right? But then if you put it in the hip heel, you'd be causing someone to run, right? Or chasing them or whatever. That's not exactly what the actual Hebrew word for run, but you get the picture. So normally you have the, the uh, uh, female being called, the male being hip heel, but here it doesn't use the hip heel. So it's not in the same way as a regular pregnancy, but um, but it uses the call that God is the, the father, like the eternal father, always the father um, the, to that child, always the parent to that child. Um, you know, from eternity, God planned and executed the virgin birth because it wasn't a, an in-time um, regular conception. But, and you, I mean, it's interesting how you see how the Bible describes something, and you go back and you read a statement like this, and oh, even the verb forms uh, kind of speak to this, right? Um, number 11. Three passages in the New Testament quote Psalm 2, verse 7. What does each passage emphasize about Jesus as God's son? Three people who are willing to read, raise your hand. Aislinn and Greg and Okay. All right. Aislinn, take the first one. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Mm -hmm. As it was written in the second song, you are my son, and today I have become your father. What does that passage emphasize about Jesus as God's son? He promised. Okay. He was promised. Um, and the the ultimate testimony that he was God's son, well, he raised him. Um, yeah. Hebrews 1 5, Greg. For to which of the angels did die every day, you are my son, they have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. Okay. So Hebrews 1, the writer to the Hebrews is making the comparison between the angels and Jesus. Basically, the writer of Hebrews is going through saying Jesus is greater than all the great things that you thought about. You know, the high priest was pretty great. Jesus is greater than that. Angels are pretty great. Jesus is greater than that. So what, what's the point? Why quote uh, Psalm 2 here? Greater than the kings of the earth. Okay. Greater than all the kings of the earth. And, and the specific birth he quotes, you are my son's dad, become your father. Uh, he says, God didn't say that to anyone else, but he said it to Jesus. Um, so the writer to the Hebrews, understanding that Psalm 2 was speaking about Jesus. Um, how about Hebrews 5, verse 5? Okay. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. 
What's the added point there when we quote this verse again from the book? almost sounds like that status was conferred upon him by God. Okay. Yeah, he didn't usurp any authority. Um, God from eternity had this plan, and, and it's demonstrated because, what, a thousand years before Jesus shows up, God says, You are my son, may I become your father. Um, yeah, good. How about 12? Revelation 2, 9 and 27 help us understand verse 9. The iron rod or scepter symbolizes that Jesus rules over all, and those who reject him will experience the word of judgment. Read also Revelation 19, 15. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. What is that iron rod, that iron scepter with which he rules? The word of God. The word of God. Yeah. Uh, he brings people into his kingdom through the word of God. Uh, he keeps them in his kingdom through the word of God. He guides and directs them um, through the word of God. And, and it's through his word that he will judge uh, those who, who rebel. But now, what's the point of the last three verses in the Psalm? Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Like an action step to the rest of the psalm. It's like, I'm going to tell you stuff, listen up, and hey, this is what you need to do now. Okay. So, and, and what do you need to do? Serve the Lord with fear. Okay. Respect the Lord. Serve the Lord. Do we hear that word fear? Are we all we all understand? Okay, you're gonna ask good. Okay. <laughs> when when you hear the word fear in the Bible, how do you understand that? Respect. I like that. Fear is is understanding who that is. Understanding the power that is there. And sometimes there's the shade of, uh-oh, I'm in trouble because the power that is there is great, right? So fear, as in I'm shaking in my boots, I'm in trouble. But other times, that 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 power that is there is great. This is awesome, right? And it's the same word that, you know, the context will tell you, um, fear. And sometimes it's both, right? So, so here, fear the Lord. Um, <laughs> Notice he's, he's, uh, uh, is that, oh, serve the Lord with fear. There it is. And celebrate his rule with trembling. So he's telling these kings who have been mocking and saying, who's God? What, what does he have to do with anything? I'm king. I'm in charge. And so now he says, um, be warned, serve the Lord with fear so that, that, uh, um, uh, either, I'm afraid that I'm going to be in trouble for not following the one who's really got the power, uh, combined with I have to respect how great his power is so that I am serving him, so that I'm in this relationship where it makes sense. I don't get to be above God. He will not stand for that. All right? At the beginning of the psalm, the kings are, are saying we're above God. And at the end, God's saying that's not going to go well. Um, kiss the sun, lest you be angry. You, you don't want that side of the fear. You want to be serving the Lord with fear and, and respect. Um, yeah. Anything else on that? I feel like I went on a tangent to that. No, um, no, no. Okay. So, the, oh, the point of the last three verses. Yeah, so you said fear the Lord. Other other uh, points of the last three verses. What's that? Okay, that warning. Okay, that, that warning of if you don't fear the Lord, there's problems. But but I love that how it ends. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. It's a warning if you're going to try to be above Him. That won't work. Uh, but but blessed. So that that happy with eschatological significance we talked about in, in Psalm one. Um, uh, 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 
happiness that comes from knowing our relationship with God, knowing how it all ends up. Um, we have heaven coming. Now, this situations in which you might turn to Psalm 2 for comfort. Yeah. God is in control and they're in him. Okay. Yeah. When would that be helpful to remind myself? Maybe. Okay. Stress. Psalm 2. Um, yep. The Lord has enthroned his king on Zion and Holy Hill. He's, he's here for his church. Good. It seems like someone else is in control. Okay. <laughs> seems like, yeah. As we get closer to November, <laughs> people tend, just because of that time of year, no, because people tend to really get worked up about politics. True, false? Yeah. Um, you know, and and what's what's causing people to get so worked up? Well, if this person gets elected, the world is over. I mean, that kind of is how the thought process goes. Um, whereas, okay, if I can reach some too and say, yes, I still want to be a good citizen and I want to make a good decision and and, and prayerfully choose the people that, that I think will do a good job in, the, in ruling our, our country. And that may be um, different from what someone else comes up with. And that's okay, because who's really in charge? It's not Biden or Trump or whoever else might, might run. It's God. And if they are thinking that they're above that, God will sort all that out. Um, yeah. Cool. Any other situation in which you might turn to some to for comfort? When you doubt that God will keep his promises to you, okay. this um, straight up tells you, no, he does. He kept them. He said, he would send Jesus said he did. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. When we talk about governments and set policies that infringe on Christian freedoms, um, entertainment, more and more of it is antagonistic to the Christian worldview. Uh, University professors may try to uh, try to, to shun Christianity. That that's foolishness. That kind of thing. Um, in all those cases, we know how God answered that, and and we know who who keeps His promises. Good. Number fifteen. Chris's favorite question. Jesus said that all the songs testified about Him. Where do you see Jesus in this song? Is the son. Okay, mm -hmm. he's the son. Verse seven, right? Are there any other songs where it is literally Jesus speaking like in this one? I mean, I'm putting you on the spot a little, but I know there are 150 of them. That's a great question. I will come back to in this study. <laughs> I mean, there are so. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why are you okay. taking me? Was the psalmist speaking, and then Jesus quotes it, but of course Jesus was there first. Yeah. And he is the word, he's the one who gave us that. So in that sense, yes. But I will proclaim the Lord's decree. I mean, that's pretty yeah. much, you know, yeah. I right. Jesus. It's, it's a little different than those I'm familiar with, but there are plenty where you get you have something spoken that only could have come from Jesus. But here we actually have him as the speaker. The speaker, yeah. yeah. Where else do you see Jesus? Can we go to the groups? You guys want to work together on this one? You're real quiet sometimes that, that uh, makes you talk a little more. All right. So back two rows. All right, group. Am I taking uh, are you gonna have enough time, Vicar? <laughs> Okay. Well, let's just do this together because we're taking a little more time. All right. Um, where else do you see Jesus? Where do you see him in verse two? While he was on earth, the spirit and the spirit of law conspired against him. Okay. Yeah. They're conspiring against the Lord and his anointed one. Who's the anointed one? 
right? The, the Messiah. And certainly we see, saw that fulfilled as they conspired against him. Even, even you know, Pharisees and Sadducees working together, um, the Herodians and the Pharisees working together, these enemies are working together. They're conspiring against the Lord. Pilate and uh, Herod, we saw in Acts 2 or in Acts 4, um, the, the believers in Jerusalem pointed that out, that that was a fulfillment of this song. Okay? How about verse 6? Where's Jesus? He's the king on Zion, right? He is the fulfillment of that prophecy. He is the, the head of the church. Uh, you already said verse 7, son. How about verse 9? Where's Jesus? Well, he is the word of God. He is the word of God, yep. And he's the one breaking them with that iron scepter. Um, he yielded, wielded the word perfectly and is the word. Verse 12? His son, right? The one we're supposed to respect. And the one we take refuge in, right? So, so all throughout, all throughout. Um, take a minute in one sentence, describe the main message of this song. So I will give you all one minute to write down your key thought from this song. What is this song about? And then I'll ask three people to share what they wrote down. Ready, set, go. All right, who will share? Notice I didn't ask who wants to share. Who is willing, for the sake of the others in the group, to share your thoughts to begin our discussion? Do you love the people in this room that much that you will share? Thank you, Therese. So I, I, um, he was a part of our love and respect, and I will be blessed. If not, you will take him Wonderful summary. Yeah, great. Who else? Uh, even though it may not seem like it, God is in control and will will protect us. Wonderful. One more? Come on. This is one word consequences. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right to the knob, right? Um, excellent. So now, how will studying this song today affect your life this week? Okay. Thing going on, he's got it all under control. Importantly, keep in mind that I'm not the one in control, and I shouldn't look for that freedom. That the true freedom is under that okay. control and his rule. Yeah, rejected Satan's lies. He comes with those lies again and again. You're not free, do this, and you'll be free. Now, that's not freedom. Awesome. Any other thoughts? How this affect? Kind of like you feel like when you're on the plane, you're on at school, and your big brother stand by and makes some stuff. There you go. Yeah. You know, I, I use the story in Bible information class, um, and I have for the last 20 years I've been teaching it, so you've probably all heard it. The uh, um, moose, the teammate I had in college, who was uh, 6'7, 275, and could lift more weight than I've ever seen anyone lift and uh, ran a 47540. Um, so just this beast of an athlete. And uh, you see that guy in the football field and you're going to have one of two reactions. <laughs> Either, uh-oh, or this is awesome, right? And, and what's the difference? The uh-oh is when I'm going against him in practice. This is not fun. The this is awesome is when he's the tackle and I'm the tight end. And uh, everybody's worried about him. I can kind of do whatever I want, right? Um, because he's on my side, and that's you know that's the the message of the song. Big big brother is there. He's got my back. Um, good. And with that, I will take off to Vicar. We're doing the uh, 
the double dip of Bible study. So we will start um, next week at the beginning of a lesson. So that'll be fun. Uh, so your assignment, read, read through Psalms 1 and 2 this week, and then uh, um, read Psalm 19 in preparation for our next one. And if you want to go above and beyond, you can read 18 and 19 because they're partner songs. So thank you. Okay. So once that catches up, there we go. So last time, just going to review a little bit, gets back into this, talking about the last of our five worst enemies, reason. So we came up with the definition of reason. That was the main part of that class, talking about what is reason, what does the Bible tell us our reason is. So we saw that reason is a gift from God, first and foremost. It's a good gift that can be used well. However, just like everything else in the world, we know everything is now corrupted by sin. That includes our reason. So what is reason useful for? Well, on our own, using our reason, we can't determine God is my Savior. That's not what reason can lead us to. If, and if anything, it leads us away. What reason is helpful for on its own in this sinful world is, of course, living in this sinful world. You know, I brought up the example of cooking last time. You need your reasoning to tell you when the chicken's done so you don't eat raw chicken and get food poisoning, right? It, it's still helpful in those ways. But on our own, our reason can't get us into, you know, faith. It can't reason us into faith. So we talked a little bit about what makes reasoning dangerous. You know, reasoning makes us want to question God. It wants us to go beyond what he tells us in his word. That's what reason is really dangerous about. And we were in the middle last time of talking about, you know, faith out of the picture. So this is just saying, what does our reason react to the law? How does it react to the gospel? So, so you know, we see our sin and our reasoning wants to say a couple things. We might say, oh, sin? You know, it doesn't know what sin is. It's just natural feeling that I have. So if I want to sleep around with everyone, why not? That feels good. Um, that's what my reasoning says. Or even if my, my mind does come to the conclusion, yeah, there's something a little off here. Well, if it's something wrong with me, I can fix it, right? I can be better. Or I'm not as bad as that person. Or God has got to be there. Or, or, you know, I'm trying my best here at least. That's what our reasoning wants to say. But we read in Romans chapter 3, what does... The Bible say about our, our sins, actually, it disagrees with our reasoning. It says, no, this is serious. This You deserve death because of this. So now we're going to look at, we're going to keep going down this logical rabbit hole. So Romans chapter 3, if you guys could open up to that, Romans chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 21 and 22. So he said, reasoning says sin isn't that huge of a deal. Bible says, yes, it is. And now this is what the Bible tells us about fixing that problem. This is what the Bible says. Romans 3, verses 21 and 22. I want you to read those two verses, please. All right, Greg, go ahead. So now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All right, thank you. So yeah, it ends up there is the no difference. There, it's not separate for anyone. It's, it's all the same. So what does that verse tell us about how God has actually fixed our problem of sin? He didn't use the law to do it. He didn't use the law to do it. Yeah, so the law terrifies us, but that's the purpose of the law. That's where it stays. Now we move on to God's gospel where he says, yes, this is what I've done. What else? It's given. 
It's given. It's not something I earned. We said up here, right? You know, I could at least do something to, to fix it myself. No, you can't. It needs to be given. The, the, the solution to our problem of sin needs to be given from someone else. And it is. It is given from God. So we read this and, and we say, you know, obviously we're all here at Bible class for a reason. We say, yes, that's perfect. But kind of role play as a skeptic here. Think about this, you know, try to pick this apart. What, you know, if you're just using your reasoning, what does it make sense about the gospel? That you are freely given salvation and there is no difference. It is for everyone. What does it sound right about that? That you don't have to do anything. Yeah. I have to do everything in life to get something. That's what I do every single day. How do I play no part? It might be even a little bit of a pride thing, too. We think, I got to be at least somewhat good enough to be able to do something here. That's what our reason would want to say. What else? So it's so natural to compare what you're doing to other people and saying, you can do this, you think you're better, and look down on the people. Yeah, so, so we think, you know, Maybe I should look a little bit better in God's sight. Maybe I do deserve it a little more than someone else. No, it's a free gift given to everyone. So we got to be careful when our reasoning wants us to think those thoughts. I mean, I know I still struggle with that too. I see someone in a different lifestyle and I think, well, yeah, you know, they deserve what's coming. And it's like, okay, humble myself here. You know, I'm not in any better spot than they are. I'm just as equally sinful. Don't let my, my mind trick me into thinking that. All right, so now we'll talk about how we can use our reasoning in, in a good way. How do we use it with our faith? So the first question, Paul tells us the first thing that we need to do with our reasoning in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Volunteer to read that passage up on the screen. Caleb, okay, well, go ahead. We demolish arguments and every presumption that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take that take captive in every thought, every, every thought to make it obedient to my Christ. Yeah, thank you. So that's the very first thing we need to do with, with our reasoning when it comes to the, the tension between reason and faith. What does Paul tell us? Demolish it. Demolish it. Yeah. Don't let it have any standing when it comes to faith. It, it does not trump your faith. It's not, it, it's not going to have rule over your faith. Yeah, anything else with that passage too? So not only do you want to destroy it first, but then you don't say, okay, reasoning is has no part to play anymore. It's going to be something I never use again for the rest of my life. No, it says take it captive. Um, you know, take control of it with your faith. And we're going to look in a little bit what, what are the next steps now that you get it. Um, we don't just say we're not going to think logically anymore. Um, we're going to use it, but in a very different way. Now. Okay. So it's okay to not be wise according to the world. Um, the world wants you to think that everything is about being the smartest person in the room. That's how you're successful. The Bible says the exact opposite. It's not all about that. First passage talks about this. Matthew 18, verse 3. So let me read that one. Patty, go ahead. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like a little child, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. What what does that tell us about how we should live here on earth? Children. Children like children depending on God and his word to take care of us. Exactly. Children are completely dependent for everything, right? That's it, It's okay to say, yeah, I am really dependent on someone else. Um, of course, you know, I, I just want you to think about, you know, whenever someone gets in an argument and people are just kind of getting down to, you know, just kind of insults, they say, oh, grow up. Like, you know, it's getting petty. Just just grow up. They act like an adult, right? Um, Jesus is saying, do the opposite. Be a kid. Say, it's okay that I don't understand everything. It's okay that I'm not the smartest person in the world because I've got faith. That's what matters. Um, you know, what is that picture? There it is. Okay. It's like, you know, a three year old comes out for breakfast in the morning. They say, Mom, I, I, want, I want to eat breakfast. I'm hungry, right? And mom gets the cereal, gets the milk, puts it out, and, and he eats it, right? 
He's not thinking about anything other than eating that food. He doesn't worry about where did it come from? Who made the food? How did mom get it from the grocery store? Did, how did she get the money to pay for the groceries? He's not worried about all that background stuff. He just knows that when he asks mom, she's going to love him and give him that cereal. Same thing with God. We don't need to worry about all the background stuff that happens. We get to go to him like a child, dependent on him. Don't even worry about how he's going to figure it all out, but trust him. Yeah, he's going to figure it out in the end. He's going to give me the good thing that I need. And it's okay that I don't know every single step of the process God helps, God takes in that. Another passage that helps us with this, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Mark, can believe that? Nancy, go ahead. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. All right, what does this passage add, add to that thought? And it's okay to not be wise according to the world. I just flat out call the wisdom of the foolishness, or what it perceived. Yeah, so the, the things we think are wise aren't always wise. And in fact, God says that's foolishness, actually. And it, this passage is so interesting because it says, in the wisdom of God. So God's wisdom said, human wisdom is not going to be the way you're saved. That's not going to be the way you're going to find this stuff out. Yeah. What else? Maybe let me ask this question. What's what's a comfort to know that it's through foolishness, not through wisdom, that we are saved? Foolishness, of course, according to human standards. What's a comfort about that? <laughs> yeah, it's it's not up to me that I don't have to have a certain IQ. I don't have to have my master's degree to, to be saved, to have faith. It's foolishness. So that means for everyone, right? Um, thank goodness, because I know I wouldn't be able to understand it enough to get to a point that I need to say I'm saved now. It's it's through foolishness. And so what if the world calls me foolish for that? God warns me right here. People are going to say it's foolish, but thank goodness it's foolishness because that's foolishness for me. And it's also okay to not know everything God has said. We talked about this point a lot last time. The, the why question, you know, it's good to ask why when we're reading the Bible. <laughs> and the problem, though, is, of course, when we ask that past what God tells us in his word. And so we get to a point now when we have faith, we get to say, okay, it's okay that I don't know everything. First Corinthians one twenty five for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So thank goodness I don't need to know everything because my knowledge is a lot less strong, a lot less wise than God's wisdom. God is, he's on top. That's what matters here. That's why it's okay for me not to know everything. Another passage we look at this. Romans 11, verse 33. I want you to read this one. Hey, or, sorry, you can go ahead. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing them. All right, what does this tell us about God's knowledge specifically here? We're not going to come close to figuring out how it works. Yeah, it just lays it out flat there. We're, we're not going to be able to, so don't try. You know, it's, it's going to, you're going to hurt yourself if you're, if you're looking into that. Um, look at the words it uses to describe it, too. The depth of the riches. So, you know, think of the deepest part of the ocean, miles below the surface, and it's just riches. It's an abundance of that. It's just unfathomable, unfathomably. Wisdom, that's what God is to us. It's unfathomable for us. But we can't search it. We can't, you know, it, we can't trace it out. We'd get lost going down that, trying to figure it all out. And Chris brought this up last time, too. He was thinking on, on the right path there. In Job chapter 38, after Job has been talking throughout that, that section, you know, saying, God is aiming against me. He's got it out for me. Um, I'm suffering. I'm suffering pointlessly. Then God steps into the picture. Finally, in Job chapter 38, he tells Job, where were you when I did all of these miraculous things? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Where are you when I make the sun rise in the morning? Where are you when I rule all of the planets, all of the stars? That's my job, Job. Um, he's got a lot more to take care of than I have to take care of every single day. And it's, this is a great thing because think about this practically. You know, kind of put this into terms we can sort of understand. A boss and his employees, like the CEO of a company. How much work would they get done if the CEO 
needed to explain to every single worker exactly every single decision he made. Nothing would get done, right? It, it's a good thing that we have these systems where <clears> we don't need to ask everything. And you know, same thing with the king and his rulers. Same problem. Nothing would ever get done if every subject needed to understand, needed to know. Same thing with the army. It would be dangerous because they can never protect anyone. They never get anything accomplished. They just be talking this whole time. So thank goodness God takes care of it for me, and I don't need to ask him. He's just going to keep doing what he does, and I'll be tasked. And so now that we know our wisdom according to the world is foolishness to God, where do we find that true wisdom then? James 1, verse 5. I want you to read that. Happy go ahead. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. All right, no kind of simple question, but where do we look for our wisdom? We look for it in God, right? He, he tells us, you know, not, not only look for it, but he invites us, yeah, come ask me for it. Um, and that just ties in with all the passages we looked at. You know, be like a child. Come back to God. Ask him for it. Ask him to give us the wisdom we need. Colossians 2, verse 3. In whom, talking about Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's, that's what's truly rich in this world. That's where our treasure is going to be. Finding it in Christ. Finding it in Jesus. In 1 Peter 1, verse 12. I'll to read that one a little bit longer of one. I know. All right, Greg, go ahead. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but ye. When they spoke of the things that they had now been told, ye by those who have preached the gospel to ye by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. All right. I know it's kind of hard jumping into the middle of a section like that. So just for, for some context, this first part is talking about the prophets. That's what Peter was writing about. So to the prophets, it was revealed what God wanted them to write down. And it's saying that, you know, they were looking into what they were preaching. They didn't fully understand how everything was going to be laid out. They didn't know how it was all going to play out. We do now, looking back at the Bible, we get that blessing here. But what's interesting is the last sentence. Even angels long to look into these things. The perfect servants of God aren't satisfied. They want to keep going back into God's will, keep looking into it, keep understanding it. How much truer of ourselves? You know, when we ask God for wisdom, we shouldn't say, God, give me wisdom, and then expect him to just miraculously make something happen up here. Sometimes God blesses us with that. But he tells us when we ask him, he says, yeah, I've given you the source of all the wisdom you need to know. It's in the Bible. Keep looking into it. And it's important to remember that there isn't a time to stop going back into God's word. Like I said, the angels are perfect, ageless. And they still long to go back into God's word. We live a much shorter life. 80 years, you know, 100 if you're very blessed by God. You don't graduate from, from reading God's word at a certain point. You can always grow in it, always learn more. Um, you know, it's, it's always incredible what I hear from people, you know, that come to church on Sunday and said, hey, Vicar, like, I just read this in the Bible, and I never thought of it so long. And these people are like 50, 60, 70 years old sometimes. And it's like, that's awesome. Like, I'm, I'm so glad that God can bless you the more time you go back into his word like that. You know, we talked about a lot, especially with the passages, where to find wisdom. It's in God. That's where the treasure of wisdom is found. This is a picture of the world's largest diamond mine. It's in Russia. I would say the name, but I'd actually butcher it, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> so you can look up if you want. But you can see just how massive that diamond mine is. These are like, you know, potentially <laughs> buildings over here, and they're, they look like toys compared to this hole. I read when I was looking at this that helicopters can't even fly over it because of the depression. Like, they'll drop into the pit because it's so deep. It's so massive. That's how, you know, much time and energy people are willing to put in to find treasure on Earth. Let's act like that with God's word too, right? Keep digging down. You know, make it a huge part of our lives that we want to keep digging into true wisdom. Um, that is God's word. And finally, now we can still use reasoning with our faith. Reasoning can be turned into an awesome tool. Colossians 3, verse 9 and 10. Volunteer to read that verse. Go ahead, Vicki. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. All right, when we come to faith, what happens to us? What does this passage say? We're made new. We're made new, right? 
we are we're, we're renewed. We're renewed in knowledge, which is you know the wisdom of our Creator of God. We are made new again. That means everything in us, all of the gifts God has given to us, even that gift of reasoning that has been tainted by sin, is made new through our faith. It's sanctified. And so now we get to use that in connection with our faith. You know, think of it like you restore an old hammer, still work with a great tool later on. Um, we won't get into that situation. Just want to say one last thing about this, too. So now God wants us to use our reasoning as a tool. I don't want you guys to leave here thinking today, great, I can just say, I don't know, I believe it because God says so. That's not what God wants us. He wants us to use our reasoning. He says in 1 Peter, be prepared to give a reason for, for the hope that you have. Use our reasoning now to go back into God's word, to gather different passages when people have questions and say, well, this is what God's word says here and here and here. Um, that's how our reasoning is renewed now. To, to get, use God's word like that, to see those connections, to make those logical jumps in God's word, of course, always under our fear. Sorry, I did a lot of talking there, but I was just trying to see that last part of it, so thank you for your patience, and let's close today with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessing of time in your word. Thank you for, for reminding us in the psalm today that you are always in control. You have everything in your hands. And thank you for also reminding us today that, that our reasoning can be an awesome gift given by you, but it is always under the gift of faith that you have given to us. Thank you for revealing your gospel. Even though it's foolishness to men, it is the most beautiful treasure and wisdom to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.